Hi everyone. Okay, quick update. Maybe quick, I don't know, it's pending. Okay, a lot of you already know Frank's passed away. He passed away on the 17th of March, 2022. Um, we had his normal doctor ask us coming for a family meeting and we know when a family meeting happens, we know what that means. And it's not good news. I already know because I've been through it already a few times myself. Okay, we'll start from the family doctor. The family doctor turned around and he says, unfortunately, Frank, there's not much more we can do for you, but keep you comfortable and hopefully we can keep you pain free. They worked out a plan for him, what they were going to do. So they did their best to keep him comfortable, which was good. He was very much loved by the staff members at the hospital, especially by the few of the nurses and one of the cleaners, which was really lovely to see. The, sec the second family meeting was even worse. He was done by video link with his oncologist. At the time then when Frank was just doing okay, he was talking fine and stuff. His oncologist just said it within weeks. And Frank's ability to talk was just going down a little bit better. So he asked me. So I told him what was going on. I told him about how many falls he's had and everything else. The last fall he had here at home, it was severe. It was terrible. He had a big cut on his head. All the skin on his arm came off. And the lucky that some of the skin was still there, so they pushed it back over. And they bandaged him up and trying to make it heal up. He was asked to go to the next country hospital where the doctor was on call. They put 15 stitches in his head, refixed him up again. And before that, he was already under palliative care because of his condition. To get Frank moving around the place, we had to use a wheelie walker, one of those things that people use to push themselves around to keep their abilities up and able to walk. Frank just wanted to do what he thought he was do best. He, he goes to me, oh honey, I'm just going to go down and do what I want to do and I'll come back home, I'll let you know. I let him go because... It's his best way to have a little time to himself to do what he wanted to do. That was one fall. Then he had another fall. Then he came here to this town to do what he loves doing. He's going for his lotto tickets and he wanted to come on his own. So I let him go. But we kept him phone contact to make sure where he was as well. He had another fall there. That's another, that was another big fall. He came home. Few cuts on his faces and stuff. Then at the old house, he had another fall. He cut his eye here and he hit the, the brick wall. So I had to get the ambulance to come and get him up off the floor again. Back at the old house, he got out of bed and fell, fell on his backside on the floor twice. So I have to go and get the ambulance again to come and get him off the floor. I knew that he was tear-rated, but I couldn't accept it. So at the end, we was asked to move out the house that was renting in one town. We had a certain time. The only pressure, it was unbelievable. I had to get all the packing done, organise people to come and help us. We got, we got the moveless truck and he was the wrong size for us to move, but it was a lovely, lovely thought he did that for us. Unfortunately, Frank went ahead and 
and why they're here where we are now. Three days later, he had another fall. I just could not believe how many falls he was having. This time his fall was really, really bad. On the edge of the door, it fell over because of too much fluid. He couldn't get his legs and move in and he asked me for help. I got up and help. By the time I got down there, it was not bang. That was it. It was on the floor. He cut his head right across here. A few other braces on the head. He had so many skin lesions moved and everything there from all the falls, all the bruises in his hands. and He was in such a mess. As Frank, as Frank's always said, we're strong. We have to keep strong, honey. Keep strong. We can beat this. We can beat this. <laughs> he was aimed to try to make it to our 10th wedding anniversary. He wanted to get remarried to me again. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. <laughs> we had planned to take a honeymoon before he got ill. We wanted to go to Tasmania. That didn't happen either. I know a lot of you are thinking, oh yeah, you can do it again. But it's not the same without someone you truly love and you want to be with them. It's not. It's not as simple. As time went on, as we moved in here, Frank picked where everything should go in the house. So while Frank was resting, I tried to unpack and, and all I could think about is, I hope he's okay, I hope he's okay, okay. I couldn't keep going. So I just left things the way they were. The house was a mess. It was not why I wanted it. I don't think so, Frank would have neither. But like he said, just take your time, honey. Like, take your time. On the 1st of March, the Frank was supposed to go to Aubrey for a, for a drainage of his stomach for the fluid. Unfortunately, he never made that hospital appointment. It was just too sick to get there at the end. From the stress of being asked to leave a house and Watching me doing all the packing, he did a little bit himself. We had a deadline. I gave us a deadline. Bloody hell, a friggin' deadline to be out by. And I didn't make it. I tried, but I didn't. <laughs> I get a phone call after to go back and redo it all. I go back and clean up what I've left behind. What do you expect me to do? I have a husband who's sick. They knew. I have a house to re, re to unpack again and go back there again and finish off a little bit of rubbish. Oh, my God. My stress level was just going through the roof. I couldn't eat for days after that. Oh, I just couldn't be bothered with eating food or anything. And within two weeks, I almost lost three kilos. I couldn't be bothered taking my medication or anything because it's so much, so much. So on the 1st of March, I said to Frank, yeah, we've got to, have to go to your appointments. He was just too tight. He couldn't even get out of bed. He couldn't hardly walk. He couldn't do anything.
with all his um, previous injuries and everything, didn't help neither. He's already had palliative care coming in from the first place. The palliative care was coming in here. She was an angel. Bloody an angel. Those workers need a bloody golden pin. Honestly, they need it. So by uh, 2 o'clock, he rang his doctor and spoke to the nurse and asked to be put in palliative care because he was concerned about me being so stressed. From everything was going on, we spoke about that before that happened. When we always said, "Yeah, things got worse, honey. We'll just do what you think is best. Your choice." He voluntarily put himself in palliative care. That was driving over for the put him in palliative care. He turned around and says, "I'm not coming home." <laughs> So from the first moment of the seventeenth of March, it was in the hospital. On the fifteenth, before the fourteenth and the fifteenth of March, before his two weeks were up, they came and talked to us, our doctor, and he says, "Unfortunately, Frank, what you two want to do? I wanted him home. I want to take care of him." I asked, and then I and then I thought about it, thought about it. I knew I couldn't do it. It broke my heart. No, I couldn't care for my own husband. I feel awful. It's someone I love, I couldn't care for. I to give somebody else to do it. This doctor asked you, can we have a family talk? Do we have any, but, oh no, it was just the hospital staff, the doctor and us too. And that doctor says, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm very sorry that I have to give you the bad news. Frank has to be staying in the hospital for permanent care. Oh God, that hurt even more. Permanent care. <laughs> Little Friday, the same week, the oncologist did a video link. And he, um, asked Frank how he was doing. F Frank was just dozing in and out, in and out, in and out. The doctor could see how bad he was. He said to me, <laughs> and the nurse in charge at the time, I can see Frank going downhill. It's not good news. What do you think? And then I told him what my thoughts were. I never held anything back from his oncologist. Oh, why? Why hold something back when you know it's happening? You want the best for who you love dearly. I'll be back. Hang on. I'm sorry. I just had to go and dry my eyes. I'm sorry. So um, when we spoke to the oncologist by video link, he asked me, I told him. <coughs> he said, unfortunately, I had to give you the sad news, Nanette. And you too, Frank. You haven't got long to go. It's within weeks. When he said within weeks, I thought... I might get him like a month or two more longer with Frank. So that Friday, he came home that night. All I could do was cry. I went back and saw Frank on the sad day. Just less than 12 hours, he deteriorated back. Did. So I thought, oh damn, I'll sit with him as long as I can. So I did. I'll be back. Uh, 
I came back that late Saturday night, did more crying. Sunday or I sat there another odd day on that Sunday. And I just sat there for nearly for 10 hours with him. The staff just keep asking me if I was okay. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. You're never fine when you get news like that, are you? You never are. I come back Monday morning to him. And one of the staff members grabbed me as I went through the door before I went down and saw him again. He said, unfortunately, Lynette, for your well-being, we'd love you to stay here with us. Take us spend so much quality time with your husband. Um, the, the hospital was kind. They gave me my meals, made sure I was comfortable, gave me my tea and coffee and Milo's and... Just gave me a fair bit to talk to the staff about different things and how I was feeling. I sat with him for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And hours. Then, um, just for a bit of break, I used to go for a walk for about a half an hour, do what I need to do, come back to him again and spend that time. Uh, Oh God, at, at the end, there wasn't, wasn't much support I could ask for. You ask for support, you think people are going to be there for you, but when people said, yeah, they want to be there for you, but unfortunately this reason, that reason, that's not support. It, that's not support. You're going to support someone. You're there with them. You're there to comfort for them. And you make sure things go fine. Two nights before, two days before Frank passed away, I noticed that his feet were falling out of the bed constantly, constantly. I noticed his toes were looking a different colour. I noticed his breathing wasn't normal. I noticed he was struggling with his throat and his skin and chest pain. Just before that, they suggested they wanted to take the pick line out he had in his arm. Oh, they said, oh, no, no, no. We can use that for other stuff to put him just in case. Still can't understand why they didn't take it out when they posted it, taking it out. Then once they said morphine, I knew then. I knew then what it meant. Oh, they said, the morphine will make him comfortable, make sure he's this, make sure he's that. But we know if you lose a loved one and they're in pain, once they put morphine into, into you to help you get you comfortable, you know, you get this gut feeling, you know something's coming. Sunday night, I was very uncomfortable about sleeping. I didn't want to sleep, I just wanted to be by his side. Because I didn't sleep that well on Saturday night. I got that fatigue. I ended up went to sleep. I was awake at four o'clock in the morning because I just had this horrible feeling. So um, I walked up to him like I was doing for a while. I was saying to him what the day is, the weather, what's like it, so what's been going on and everything else. He told him he told me that his mum and dad had seen come and visit him at least three to four times while he was in the hospital. I asked the nurse what that meant. That he, they said unfortunately when they start seeing the family members it means it's not far off. So I got up again, went back to his room after I asked him and I said to do you Frank. If you've got enough energy, please tell me how you're feeling. All you can say, I'm sorry, honey, but I love you. I've seen mum and I've seen my mum and dad now at least four times. 
And like he said, the day before he passed away, I love you, Nanette. And I always will love you. I said to say thick back. I said to Frank, you're my true love and my only true love I'll ever have. <laughs> I'll never marry, get married again. I don't want to get through it. I love my Frank. I really do. I think a lot of you know how close we were. We were on separatable. Unless we, we had to do the things that we wanted to do. The morning of the 17th, I got up. I straight to him and said he was okay. white. I rubbed his hands to try to get the circulation back in there and it didn't work. <laughs> so I knew he had circulation problems because of the car accident. I caught him past the night. I was just still standing there holding his hand. This is strange. The director of the hospital came and saw me and asked me how I was doing. And she looked at Frank and she walked out. About half an hour later, the palliative care lady came back in. I can see Frank was dying then. I promise I'd be there to him to the end. I made a promise. I kept my promise. In between time, I was still before he passed away, I was trying to make arrangements for a funeral so he could be ready to go, but he did. So hard, no one will accept it. No one. It's really hard. I know that um, Mrs. Pelletier care lady, she was marvellous. She was there with me as well when Frank went. She kept checking his pulse on his neck. The second time she checked, I said, he's gone, isn't he? She said, yes. I knew it. I didn't think Daddy was gone by then. I just just grabbed him and cried. Then I kissed him on the forehead and I said, I love you, baby. I always will love you. <sighs> the hard part is now is trying to get over the grief. And I got, I got the ashes. I know that now. Yeah, I've got to be. 
You know what his wish is? Is to have us two put together when I pass away with these ashes. You know what? I'm going to fulfill that wish. I'm going to have to do something about that. You know, when he was able to talk, he said to me, and he can do me a favour. This man's sick and he still wants to do really lovely things for people. He says, can you go down to the coffee shop, go and give them $50 and say that's for the ambulance drivers who came out to us and he had all the forms. I've granted that wish. I've already done it. I have no idea how. Some of you may know what, how, how, how it is when you, you want to grant someone's wishes and you just do it. You do it because you love them. They gave me more time to spend with him after he passed away. And uh, I still kissed him on the forehead. And I will always say, honey, I love you. Even now he's gone, I still say, honey, I love you. I know the grieving's going to take a while. I know a lot of you going to say, I oh, keep strong in it, you can do it. I know eventually I'll have to go for grieving cancelling because I know I'm going to struggle. Um, I do have people that uh, knew me just as um, online as a friend. They've been inboxing me. I've had a friend that um, friends that call see how I'm doing. I had a lovely bunch of flowers sent to me from my tape teacher. That was the most beautiful thing. I had a card sent to me from a lady that I think she may only met Frank once. Yeah, there's a few things I never told you about Frank as well. Oh, I'm going to share them to you what my, my thoughts were. Frank was the most amazing man. Loving, caring, understanding. A bloody fabulous cook. Pavlovas. Mean. Banana cat. Mean. Oh, God, it was the best. He even taught me a few tricks and trades about cooking that I did not know. He even taught me how to make scones properly. I know, simple little things like that can happen. But it was a good thing. We had a good few laughs on the way. We had a few good singing songs on the way. Last year we didn't able to spend Christmas because he was in the hospital for, for that. Because his potassium level went down to 2.8. His white cells were down as well. I met Frank online for a dating website in 2013. We were, we were engaged within two months. <sighs> well, like you say, that was quick engagement. Not, not to me, not to him. I knew Frank was the right man from the first time I saw him. Through the webcam, his baby blues caught me big, big time. Before we even said yes, we'll go and have a cup of coffee, meet up. We was chatting online for a while, and uh, it was a Friday morning. We met up, had a cup of coffee, and chat for hours and hours. I oh, know a lot of you's going to say, "Oh." What else did he do? I'm going to be honest with you. I was really shy when I first met Frank. A lot of you are going to say, oh, no, nah, not you. You're not shy. Oh. I was. 
we made another big decision after that. Um, we'll keep continue seeing each other as much as we can. If we can't, we'll just talk on the phone or through the weekend. So we did that too. My husband was an amazing man. I can't fault him whatsoever. He tried his best to give me that support and love that someone can give while you're on a disability pension. Well, other people may know it's called welfare. But I didn't care. I couldn't care less he was on that. On that first day, he told me that we can't. Have, he, he can't give. He, he's not able to have children. That didn't bother me. I really didn't have none from my first marriage. So why why should I worry about that? If you're going to love someone, why worry? And at that age, it was, was a good thing too because imagine a nearly a fifty plus year old gentleman and myself running around with a two year old. I know a lot of people do it, but nah. Uh, so the next best thing was to our children was my dog when I first met Frank I, online I told him I had a daughter named Lulu it was the most hilarious joke I ever did to him the most hilarious I didn't tell Frank that my, my daughter was my dog I just told him I had a seven-year-old dog named Lulu. <laughs> he actually believed me. <laughs> oh, gosh, Frank. That was just amazing. He believed me. So that was all right. So we continued catching up, catching up. And I finally turned around and said to Frank, Frank, it's time to meet Lulu, my daughter. Let me show him smiling for because I know what's going to happen now. He got all dressed up. Man, he was top, top dressed. Best way a pensioner can do. He was still freaking handsome as. I pulled up. Frank's has a hot chocolate for me and a coffee for himself. And I thought that was freaking fabulous. I came out of the car, opened the car door, and what jumps out? My dog. The look on Frank's face was you cheeky bugger it's on so actually you know frank actually knocked my shyness out of me the only reason why we met in parks because i had i had severe anxiety as well so um i still have that problem but it's not as much The house we're in now, and they say we because I still class my beloved still here with me. All the rooms was chosen by him. I set it up the way he wanted it, and that's the way it's going to stay. It's it. it it's going to be really tough going. I know. I know. I know I said it before. I know it's going to be. But what can I do? You know, when you're feeling down and you want something to hug, you know, I do. I go out and pick up the freaking chalk. That white one that Frank picked out. I go out there and I pick up Mama G and I just give her a hug. And she just puts her head right on my chest. And I just give her hugs. Be grateful for it. And it it kind of helps. I still grab my camera now and again. And I go for little walks. Yeah. Then I go for a coffee. The same we used to do. Oh, gosh. Where I live now, people knew us before we moved here. Not through me, but through Frank. The other day I went into the coffee shop here in town at the bakery. Lady walks up to the counter and she goes, 
Hey, what can I do for you? I said, I want Frank back. <laughs> she said, unfortunately, we can't help you with that. But I can remember, she said, I remember one thing we remember about Frank. It was his ace sugar. That put a smile on my face. Then she came in, she brought my coffee out. She goes, you know, each time these guys came in, there may be whatever days. We knew exactly what the both of you want, but we never knew your name. We knew Frank. And we knew Frank and was eight sugars because we had already written it down on paper before we got there. Then he ordered his bread. They knew his bread. And, oh, God, they knew everything. What he was like to eat and drink. In the last town we were in, Frank came to Secretary Treasurer at the mention. He started doing tributes for the previous treasurers or presidents. I was asked for a photo of Frank. I gave it to him. They're going to hang in photo of the mention. <laughs> I can ask me to hang it up in memory of it. I love my friend so dearly. It was the love of my life. My second husband has passed away from cancer. But this is more tougher than anything else. Sorry for the long video, but I just have to share this moment with you. In the memory of Frank. It's tribute. Was made for my beloved Frank. I love him and I always will. Catch us next time. Bye.